basically, I, I am the uh, CEO of a small startup called FTC Plasma Solutions. So we work on solving tough combustion challenges in energy, aerospace, and national security. So I actually started that as a high school science fair, and then somehow I ended up here as a rocket scientist and a huge nerd speaking at a design conference. So I'm not totally sure what I'm doing here, right? This is, you know, where I spend most of my time. It's a pretty messy lab, so this one is where I'm just settling into at Argonne National Lab in the western suburbs. I know nothing about design, so to put that into context, I usually will text my mom and my sister a picture of the shirt and tie combination that I'm planning on wearing when I'm going somewhere important like here. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine they didn't answer in time today, so I'm not wearing a tie. Uh, <laughs> So that's why when Dave, one of the organizers, called me, he was like, hey, do you want to speak about the design of everything at a conference? And I was like, well, I know pretty much nothing about the design of anything. But he's like, no, 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 design is just how we move from the state in which we are into the state in which we want to be. And I was like, okay, you know, as an engineer, that's sort of what I do, right? We, we take the state in which we are, which, you know, there's some technical problem, and we move into the state we want to be. And as engineers, we try to find some technical solution to bridge that gap. You know, in the aerospace industry, which is, I guess, where we work, that's also what we do, right? You move from the state in which you are, which for me is a transplanted Floridian, say, Illinois in the winter, to the state in which you want to be, so say, Florida or, or somewhere warmer. All jokes aside, it's always amazed me, even you know, learning about airplanes and how they work for you know, the better part of my career, uh, how you can wake up in one city, have breakfast, maybe go to a meeting, get on an airplane, and then be 100 miles away and then make it for dinner. Right? And that's one of the, I think, big conveniences of modern life, one of the ways that, that our world is, is so connected. And, and passenger traffic is growing at an impressive rate. Right? It's so easy to get on an airplane, and you know, we take it for granted that we can be somewhere else whenever we want. But all of this, of course, takes a lot of energy. Uh, for the foreseeable future, that's always going to mean some sort of fuel, right? We're always going to be burning some sort of hydrocarbon fuel, maybe one day hydrogen in a jet engine, and it's going to push this skinny tube across the sky, and then we're going to get somewhere where we want to be. So that, of course, takes a lot of money, right? $30 billion in 2015 alone for just U.S. airlines. So you're burning a lot of fuel, and then, of course, there's some non-negligible emissions that people are starting to take notice of and, and trying to regulate. Now, because of this, the airline industry has been pretty good about designing solutions to you know, find their way around this problem, right? to see how they can become more efficient, how they can reduce how much they're spending on fuel, how they can charge you for that extra bag and reduce the uh, space in between seats. Right? All of this is, is part of the very difficult uh, problem of, of airline economics. So because of this, airlines and airframe manufacturers and engine manufacturers have gotten pretty good at making engines and airplanes and operations in general about as efficient as you can, right? So there's been, you know, about 1% a year improvement. But as an engineer, we always look at this and say, well, where's there room for more, right? Even though there's been tremendous strides made in the industry, you can see the curve is sort of, you know, starting to, to flatten out a little bit. So that means that any little bit of improvement that you can give them could give a huge economic benefit. You know, this is sort of the, the problem that I was handed, right? This is the, the beginning of, of the design space. To explore that, let me give you two seemingly unrelated things. You know, a household gas stove and a 737 powered by two big CFM 56 engines. So what do these have in common? You might say, well, both of these, you know, you're burning some sort of fuel and you're getting something out of it. So in a stove, you're using the chemical energy in the fuel, you're converting it to heat and you're using that to cook. Uh, in an airplane, you're using the chemical energy in your jet fuel, and you're burning that, and you're using that to generate thrust. So we all know in a stove, you know, there's certain conditions that can make that flame extinguish, right? If you spill some water on it, if you blow it out, or if you reduce the amount of fuel going, you know, the flame will go out. And then, you know, the same thing happens in, in, a, in a jet engine, and it's, it's an even bigger problem. In a jet engine, it's more like if you point a leaf blower at that stove and you try to keep that flame lit. These are constraints that you know, all engine manufacturers have to deal with. And the, the bottom line is that there's this fundamental point where if you reduce the amount of fuel going to your stove or your engine, your flame extinguishes, even if there's still you know, fuel coming out. So what does that mean in practice? It means that you know, when you're sitting at a busy airport and the pilot says, we're number 21 for takeoff, and you're sitting for 45 minutes at O'Hare, your engines are running, but the pilots can't lower the fuel flow to those engines anymore or else the flame will extinguish. That's bad on the ground. You can imagine in the air, that's even worse. So because of that, there's these constraints on, on how we build, uh, design, and operate engines that keep them away from what their you know, possible optimum uh, operation is. So in other words, that means that there's ways to save fuel if you can keep 
that flame lit. Doesn't sound too exciting. I get pretty fired up about this stuff, but uh, <laughs> I make that joke once a week, so don't, don't laugh too much. Um, <laughs> You know, these engines are, are impressively complicated machines. You look on the front and you can see, you know, this spinny thing, the fan that sucks in a bunch of air, but inside it's just an amazing array of, of technical wizardry. But one of the most difficult things is combustion, right? Keeping that flame lit and stable. Uh, like I said, that's, if that goes out and you're on the runway, it, it's a bad day. But if you're flying, uh, it's a very bad day. So the industry has really worked to make sure that we make these engines as safe as possible for good reason. But one of the difficulties with doing this is that you only really have one, one knob, right? One, one paintbrush to control the design space of how these engines work. So if you can give the designers and the, the uh, manufacturers of jet engines another tool to control how we keep this flame lit and how we keep this flame stable, you can make a better engine. And it turns out that we find the solution in nature, right? We can use plasma, right? So same as you would find in a projector and a fluorescent light in a plasma TV. It's the fourth state of matter. So think of it as a soup of charged particles with a lot of energy that's bouncing around and, and is ready to interact with a bunch of different um, chemicals and increase the rate of chemical reactions. Right? So it's, you know, you have this really high energy thing. It's good at improving combustion. So that's something that's pretty well known, but not well understood. So. You know, basically what's going on is in a combustion reaction, you know, you have these big fuel and air molecules, right? So you think of those like uh, giant blocks of Legos. So if someone gives you, you know, a giant block of, block of Legos, right, and asks you to build a car out of it, first you have to take off all of those individual pieces, right, before you can build the car or whatever you're trying to build. And that takes time and that takes energy. So the same thing happens in a combustion reaction. You have these big organic molecules that you have to break apart piece by piece before you can build the products of the combustion reaction. Now, if someone gives you the block of Legos, shoots it with a marble, and then you, know, you have all those pieces, then you could much more quickly assemble whatever you're trying to make. So the same thing happens in a combustion reaction. If we can take those big molecules, hit them with really fast charged particles from plasma, then you know, all of a sudden we can keep a flame lit with less fuel, or we can do a bunch of interesting things with, with increasing the stability of a flame. So that's all fundamental science that's you know pretty well known. But the challenge is, how do you take that science and actually make something with it, right? How do you take that science and put it at the service of a technology? And then to paraphrase Pope Francis, how do you take that technology and put it at the service of a product which is gonna go into society and do something you know hopefully beneficial for humanity, whether it's you know making engines safer, saving on fuel, reducing our energy costs. The first part of this, going from the science to a technology, that's essentially an engineering problem, right? That's thinking, you know, where should we put this plasma? How do we make it in the lab? What's the best way to do this? That in itself is a pretty hard problem. But then, then you have to go, okay, now how do I get that technology out of the lab and into the real world, right? And technologies make it from the lab to the real world when someone cares enough to buy them. So there's definitely an engineering challenge there, right? How can you design something that's reliable enough, that fits in the right hole that it's supposed to, that does everything that the end users want it to do? But there's also an entrepreneurial component there. So that's how I found myself really becoming an entrepreneur as a natural extension of becoming an engineer, right? Because it's not just enough to design a solution to a new problem to get you from the state in which you are to the state in which you want to go. You have to make sure that your solution can bridge that gap, right? And you have to carry your solution across the finish line. This problem, after you solve the technology, being an entrepreneur and, and pushing that into the market, that's, I think, where, where the real challenge lies. Not something at all I knew when I started this research. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting problem. So basically started working on this like any normal kid as a high school sciencer. This is a setup that I put in my garage. I pretty much had the gas tank for my barbecue grill and a giant vacuum cleaner that I don't know where we got it from, but somehow you could put it in reverse and it would spit out a bunch of air. So connected it to a pipe. Uh, this thing really looked like a bomb. I flew with this once uh, going to, to a science fair. So the first thing I did, you know, I set this up and then I went to ask my dad, dad, do we have good insurance? Sort of just like asking for a friend kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, and that ended up being a pretty good question because, you know, sometimes this would happen. But, you know, it, it showed that, that it worked and I sort of played around with fire. I called it research, but that's being a little bit generous. It was really just a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> my neighbors, you know, across the street from me, he was a fire marshal. So <laughs> whenever I'd be running this with the garage door open, I would like almost see his wife like peeking out the window. And <laughs> they told me years later that they would be talking like, do you think we should tell his parents? Like, no, 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 no. He, he knows what he's doing. I don't know how much I actually learned from it, but it was pretty cool. We didn't really discover any you know, groundbreaking science here, but it was it was good learning experience of 
how you uh, take something that you had read, take a phenomenon that's naturally occurring, and try to replicate it and see if you can do anything practical with it. So I ended up presenting that at the International Science Fair, which is like, you know, I, I'm a swimmer, so I always compare it to the, the Olympics of, uh, of science fairs, as, as nerdy as that sounds. And when we were flying back, one of the teachers who went with us pointed out the window and said, can you imagine if in 10 years, every airplane that's flying is more efficient because of something that you built? That kind of stuck with me, and I thought, well, you know, it's fu pretty fun playing with fire, and I should maybe continue doing this research, right? So when I uh, started engineering school at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, I started talking to some professors and some friends and uh, cobbled together the first prototype, which you can see is very carefully assembled with some hot glue there. Uh, no duct tape on this one, but there's definitely present in, in other setups. Then I somehow convinced the professor to let me have a corner in his lab. What you can't see is a little wooden cabinet that was right above there, which was in really good position to be absolutely incinerated by the flame. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, that didn't happen, and you know it ended up working. So now. This was, I guess, the third year of experience with playing around with plasmas and flames and seeing how they interacted and seeing how we could do something practical with them. So it started to get a little bit more real here. This is where you know, we started doing something that was maybe actually new. So in talking to a lot of the, the great mentors I have, they sort of convinced me that the best way to keep developing this might be not as a pure research project, but as a startup. Uh, a startup? What? That was sort of an interesting idea to me. I didn't know much about engineering because I was a sophomore, knew nothing about business but I had to sort of learn how to get into that world. One of the things I learned is that, you know, just because you can solve a problem from an engineering approach, that doesn't mean that you've really solved the problem because it might not actually get into the real world, right? So there's this combination of the technical merit of your solution and the feasibility. So to really make a, a good solution, right, make something that's gonna go into the real world, you have to take into account both of these factors. So I don't think I came up with this chart, but I don't remember if I saw it somewhere. Um, Essentially, you know, you've got on one axis your technological merit, so how good the science is behind your solution. And on the other side, you have the feasibility. So down here, you have things that don't work and are very uh, expensive. So think expensive perpetual motion machines. And then on, one, on the other side, you have things that are cheaper but still don't work. So think just perpetual motion machines. And then somewhere in here, you have you know, some optimum where the solution has technical merit and it's actually implementable, right? So it's not crazy expensive, it doesn't use any sort of materials, and you can actually get this into the real world. But what I was sort of persuaded by my mentors to realize was that you don't know where that place is unless you always think of the research you're doing as a business, right? Unless you always have one eye on the commercialization or on the market and the other eye on the science, right? Because as a scientist, you always want to solve the problems that are the most interesting. But that doesn't necessarily bring you any closer to getting your solution out of the lab. Because when you're doing applied research, what you really have to focus on are the problems, not necessarily that are the most interesting, but the problems that remove the most risk from your technology, the ones that get you to that next point. Now, we sort of knew what direction we wanted to go. We knew that we have this you know, startup, I called it FGC Plasma. Don't think that has anything to do with my name, Felipe Gomez Del Campo. Someone asked me once if it was fuel, gas, and combustion. I was like, yes, that's what we will go with. Um, <laughs> so the next, you know, big milestone here was to build a team. There's a lot of things around here that I didn't know. Pulled around from different people at Case Western Reserve University, a couple of uh, athletes, roommates, and we, you know, made a team. Somehow got the university to give us lab space in a basement somewhere where, you know, they had plausible deniability. If something blew up, they didn't know what we were doing, but, you know, safety first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so here we started working on saying, okay, we know that plasma works, we know that it can improve combustion, how do we get this into an actual engine? And what we settled on doing was, what if we modify a part that's already in the engine, right? So we settled on the fuel injector. So how can we change that part to include a plasma and then we can you know, harness this naturally occurring phenomenon and get it inside of an engine in a way that's practical, right? Because if you develop a solution that requires you to, you know, completely change everything about the engine, that's going to cost billions of dollars. So that's not going to work. Uh, so we figured out what's the minimum change that we can do to an engine and to a fuel injector to include this new technology. This is finally what we settled on. We ended up getting a patent on it. And here you can actually, you know, see how this works. You have these blue things, which are you know, filaments of plasma interacting with a flame. So now we had a company and we had a patent, we had raised some money, but we were still, you know, not totally sure uh, what we were gonna do with this. So it was 
a little bit back to the drawing board, talking to some of the engine manufacturers, some of the people in the aerospace industry, freaking out exactly what they wanted. So we knew you know, what they wanted was broadly in the parameters of we had, what we had already built, but now we had to demonstrate that. I'll show you a little bit of, of how this actually works. And so essentially, this is our lab. We light a flame with plasma, and then we turn the plasma off, and we start decreasing the amount of fuel, right? So when you decrease the amount of fuel, the flame really doesn't like it. It starts to become very unsteady, it starts to move around, and eventually it blows off. When we turn on the plasma, with that same amount of fuel, we can actually keep the flame lit. Uh, so that, that translates very well to being able to have a, an engine run on the runway with less fuel. And then what we saw is that we can actually keep that flame lit with up to 60% less fuel. So for airlines, that could translate to around a, a 1% to 5% decrease in fuel consumption, which could be really huge for airlines. Now we had shown it in a lab, we had a patent on it, the next step was to go to bigger and better things, right? So as you can imagine, it's different what you can do in a lab on a sort of small scale thing that's reasonably safe to something that you would put inside of an engine, right? It's a whole bunch of different conditions that really change the science around it. So we had to go work with NASA Glenn Research Center. They were very gracious and helped us and let us put our sort of unproven technology into their very expensive combustors which simulate the inside of an engine. So you basically have this lab that gives you exactly what you would have inside of an engine and gives engine manufacturers who we would potentially partner with a lot of confidence of, okay, this is what they did and it would actually work if we stuck it inside of one of our engines and it wouldn't you know, melt or, or blow anything up. Thankfully, we, we showed that it actually worked. This was pretty big because the first time we tried it, the power supply actually blew up um, which there's a lot of explaining to do and a lot of uh, safety committees to answer to. And so that delayed our, our project a couple of months, but you know, eventually we got to the point where we had proven technology at conditions inside of a jet engine and we had a patent on it. From there, the next step was, now we need to find our own lab space, right? We, we've sort of outgrown the university, both from safety reasons and for funding reasons. So this is sort of what, what brings me to Chicago. We just got a big grant from the Department of Energy. So we're working right now out of Argonne National Lab to both set up our own lab here, learn a little bit more about how to optimize, how to improve the design of this technology, and then how to demonstrate it on an actual engine. So we have a partnership with a small microturbine company, and we're going to be developing our technology specifically for their engines. You know, this has been a pretty pretty incredible journey that I would never have expected when I was asking my dad uh, if our insurance was good, right? So <laughs> I've ended up in, in places that I, I'm not quite sure how, like this conference, but you know, one of the more incredible things I've gotten to do was to go to the White House. There was a big event about entrepreneurship that I somehow was in the right place at the right time, got recommended to go to. So I was actually on a panel with some of the, the sharks from Shark Tank, and then after we got to go meet the president. He told us something that's, that's always stuck with me. That's saying that our generation is really going to be the ones that are going to have to solve some of the really tough problems in our world. Think uh, climate change, national security, food security, sustainable development. All these very tough problems. And you know, some of those are going to be solved by big incumbent players in the market space. And uh, some of them are going to be solved by entrepreneurs. Because entrepreneurship is really that process where you have an idea and you make it a reality. Right? It's how you go from the state in which you are uh, to a state in which you want to be. So it's the full scope of the problem, both from engineering the technical solution to actually making sure it's, it's implemented in the market. And then he actually continued that and said, and, you know, and that's the basis of the American dream. So me, with a name like Felipe Gomez Ocampo, I came from, from Mexico as a, you know, as a child with my, with my parents, first through England and then through here. So being an immigrant, this really resonated with me, and it sort of stuck with me that, hey, you know, maybe I should keep doing what I'm doing here. Maybe I should keep, uh, I guess, designing. Now I know that this is designing uh, <laughs> <laughs> solutions. So uh, yeah, that's, that's basically where we are.